Welcome back on the show. <laughs> Today, we have uh, another guest that's going to talk about the ocean. It's becoming a little bit of a theme in some of the episodes that I've been doing. And it's no surprise that I do love the ocean. But I've got no idea about this main topic that we'll go through today, which is sailing. Nick Perduan, welcome on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Good morning. How many times have you sailed Sydney to Hobart? Uh, I just finished my 12th one. 12th? 12th, yeah. And have you lived in Australia all those 12 years? 13 years, yeah. So wow. the very first year, so the first year I moved here, 2006, I arrived in October uh, with my wife and uh, I couldn't get a ride. I, like I just... Oh, you couldn't get on the Sydney to Hobart. Yeah, it was just too close of a time. People don't like to put someone new on that <laughs> <Last> close. <minute. laughs> yeah, yeah. Unless they're like absolutely de- desperate, especially not, uh, not... Australians and not that race just yes. because of how bad it can be you just don't want an unknown factor so that totally makes sense yeah so I, I my first year here I actually just went to Manly went up to the heads and watched it all just watched it you like yeah. next year I'm on there yeah. <laughs> yeah so explain to the listeners where you're from and okay a little bit of your uh, yeah well I'm uh, I'm Canadian uh been born and raised in a place called Windsor, Ontario, which is like uh, in the Great Lakes. So hence all the sailing. I grew up, my dad was a sailor. I grew up sailing. Uh, actually, Windsor is a border city with uh, Detroit, Michigan. So uh, I like to tell people it's the difference between uh, like Kirribilli and the CBD here in Sydney. <laughs> That's yeah. the difference between America and Canada. Yeah, Canada. Just one little river separates. Uh, so I grew up. So yeah. you grew up sailing f- on freshwater lakes. Yeah, hundred percent. Actually, it's windy up there. Hey, no, it's actually light. Ah. it's known for its light air. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it can be windy. I mean, obviously you get. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, generally pretty windy. Summer times it's like hot, humid, calm. Yeah. You I get, gotta ask. Have yeah. you seen any surf on those lakes? No. Well, uh, Lake Michigan. Definitely. And one of the places we sail out of uh, Makatawa, which is Holland, Michigan, there is a break there. They've got this long jetty of a lighthouse. And when it gets pumping, there is a break there. But I've never seen it. Freshwater lake surf. I've got yeah. to do that one time. Yeah. yeah. I've been at, I, I have been once in Chicago. Uh, I had to deliver uh, a 70 footer, which is uh, deliveries are like when you race somewhere, the racing people get the boat there during the race. And then there's usually a group of people that come in and have to take the boat back. Oh, yeah. Uh, And I was probably 18 years old. I was just a young guy, and I got asked to do a delivery back. So from Chicago all the way up around Lake Michigan, back down to Lake Huron, back to Detroit, which is 650-something miles, something like that. How many hours is that of driving? It was like two days, two and a half days. So do you sail the boat back, or do you drive? You put it on a truck. No, 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 we motor it. We literally just motor it up. We motor sail, so we put like one sail up and get going. But So you're just using diesel? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So when we left, uh, because you're shorthanded, big boat usually has 20-something people on it. There's only four of us, so you can't physically do everything that you would and put the sails up on it, because you don't have enough people okay so when you're sailing it for racing there's 20 crew on yeah and then when you're motoring it back on diesel there's four of you yeah four or five yeah and you only need that so that when you have the watches you've got at least two people up on deck in case something goes wrong in the delivery while two people are sleeping but when i left chicago that was bonkers it was like 10 foot waves it was crazy and we left and we you like we had to make a timeline a to get the boat back so we had to leave and it was terrible I was sick i was so sick and it's four of you <laughs> yeah and how many hours sorry did you say oh that it takes? took us like two days two and a half days two days damn oh so you're just sleeping on shift yeah no. how many sleeps at a time just one of you or no no so it would be two on two off in that case oh, wow. yeah yeah so before you yeah. sail as we digress <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, all, that's good uh that's that doesn't sound like fun at all to me. No, it's not. It's, <laughs> but it, what it does offer delivery crews in the racing world, uh, the people that generally uh, don't get the opportunity to go race these big mm. high-end boats, uh, if you know the right people, you can get on the delivery crew and get to go sail these boats or go mm. on them and take them back to where they need to go. Yeah, At least you get that opportunity if you never get to make make like the racing team yeah i guess that's where you start right yeah because i was going to ask 
before you do Sydney to Hobart mm. 12 times, <laughs> yeah. where do you begin? Uh, what think, did you start out with? Well, I, like I grew up sailing. I, so I, my dad, I, like very small scale where we're from like club level stuff. Uh, you just go sailing and racing and racing. And, uh, as a young guy with a bit of enthusiasm, like people want to have you on their boat. So if you're keen, you just start chipping away. So, uh, as I was growing up, I, I was racing little boats. And so one person boat? Yeah, one yeah. little person That's what boats. they do at the Olympics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So the Olympics, there's a what bunch of different called? class. Well, there's a bunch. The, oh. well, the main ones are called, uh, there's a, a laser, which is the men and women sail them. That's the one I've heard of, yeah, yeah. the laser, yeah. And I sailed those for years and years and years and years and years. And I was on all How these teams. How old were you when you started sailing laser? 13. Yeah, okay. So you just yeah. get thrown on a little laser by yourself at 13 and just like get yeah. from A to B as fast as you can. But nowadays, there's an even smaller one called an Opti, which is like a little bathtub. And when you're like eight years old, you get started in that. <laughs> do they do the Opti at the Olympics? No. No, so the laser is the, the smallest at yeah, the Olympics. Yeah, so, but the Opti is the stepping stone. So if you're okay. like, you've got, eight. yeah, you've got like, I call them hockey parents, but sailing parents, they put you into an Opti before... <laughs> You start doing that, and then you usually move up to a laser. Yeah. And then a laser, you can go up. There's a there's other classes that you can go do. And then that's kind of what I did, basically. So, so I went, I was on these youth teams. I went sailing and lasers. Uh, uh, in 2000, I started sailing a two handed boat called a 470. Two handed boat. Explain yeah. what that uh, is. Just two people. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so a bit bigger, it's more four sails. Handed. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Double handed. Double handed. Yeah. <laughs> uh so uh I started doing that. Uh and with someone equal age or roughly yeah, similar age? The guy I did it with, Craig, he was a little bit older than me. Okay. Yeah. And but you're we, not adults really. No, we're still in our mm. uh late twenties. Early twenties at that stage. I was twenty three, twenty four, kinda. Uh and I'm trying to think of the timeline here. So we were still sailing those little boats, but also sailing big boats at the same time. So mm. getting different rides, doing different races. Uh, so the way it works in North America is in the winter time you can't sail. So we would go down to Florida and race in the winters. Uh -huh. So there's a bunch of different series of big boat sailing and little boat sailing that we'd always just drive down. And uh, you could hop on from Detroit. Uh, there's this road called I-75 and you hop on and 24 hours later, you're in Miami. 30 hours later, you're in Key West. So you, you, don't truck, have to your, a, you truck your yeah, boat those, down. Yeah. One wow. of the craziest stories, I, I remember I was like 18 years old, and there was these, uh, a 30-footer, uh, and I had to, me and two other guys drove, it was a mum 30 or a, I can't remember back then. It was that long ago. But we had to drive this 30-footer on a trailer down to Miami got lost in the ghetto because Miami, it's like, it's beautiful. <laughs> and then it's ghetto. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. Like on the strip and it's nice. And it's like, what do you see in all the movies and pictures? Yeah. And then like five kilometers inland. It's terrible. And you <laughs> guys are driving you with a sailboat on the back. Massive sailboat on the back, <laughs> trying to find this little, little place that we had to put the boat in the water yeah. and motor it around. You might as well drive around with a dollar sign above the car. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We've got money. <laughs> Yeah, sketchy. But that was back in, you know, that's the early 2000s. I feel like it was a yeah. different time back then. So, yeah, that's how you, everyone does it. Uh, I actually tried to go to the Olympics for in Athens for 2004. We did terrible. It was high. What type of boat and how a, many crew? A 470, and that's the two-person. Yeah. Uh, we did terrible. Like, it, uh, it was a great experience, and I wish I'll never... It was the experience was worth more than the poor result, which mm. is you know I never take that back. The traveling we traveled all around Europe for three years. So you had to do events. a series of races to qualify. Yeah, basically without getting too in depth on how you the national and international qualifying all works, but yeah, can be complicated. We had a boat in America. We had a boat in Europe. We were lucky enough that the, the guy I was sailing with he had. Uh, friends in switzerland so we were able to keep our boat in switzerland and fly in and out and we drive switzerland there's no ocean there no but it's in the middle <laughs> thank god oh so you're racing around to france yeah spain. so we'd go to spain we'd go to france the netherlands denmark croatia you name it yeah wow how Some many big road trips so roughly trips. how many races did you do for the olympic qualifying process oh, was over the years i couldn't even tell you like 50 
No, no maybe not, not one that week. week. No, 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 God, no. It was probably we would do one month or two month stints over there because just have mm. feasibility of traveling and it used cost. to cost a lot more to to fly at least. Mm. So we'd rent a van, live in the van, stay over there for a month, stay over there for two months, and do uh, it was like the Euro Olymp circuit. Uh, and it's basically back then started in Barcelona. We went to Palma. Uh, then you go back up to the Netherlands. Wow. Uh, so, and is this, this just you and your partner traveling? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was okay. a full like uh, van life. Like that's great. Or Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You would have seen so much though. Hey. Yeah. And that's why I say I'll never, even though we did really bad and didn't qualify yet, spent a lot of money doing it. Uh, the experience and growing up and, you know, the hard work, like we were sailing 150 to 200 days a year. We we're on the water. And there isn't that, you know, when you look at now that we're grown ups with families and jobs and life's like, I'll never, no chance. There's no chance unless uh, you're now you uh, elite that. level, uh, where that's your job to go do that. And like, say elite level Australian sailing team, that's what mm. they do. You just, that's your profession. Yeah. So it's your full time job. Yeah. What was the best race that you guys did there? The best in terms of placing? Yes. Uh, it was, we were top 20. We just got, we made gold fleet in Kiel, which is, what uh, mean? which is, uh, uh, so you get so many boats, uh, say there's a hundred boats racing. Mm. all 100 boats can't start at the same time uh so you have Makes different sense. fleets so you, you have a few days of qualifying uh they split you all up into different groups each of the days the groups all change and you have qualifying races and then you're bracketed and put into gold silver and bronze fleets depending on how you placed yep. in those qualifying events gold fleets like you always want to be in gold fleet because that's where the best of the best are mm. and uh then you move on to the metal races, yada, yada, yada. Silver and bronze, you're just chipping away. Yeah. Uh, rarely was there ever a bronze fleet that they needed that many 470s, that type of boat. There's always silver and gold. So we had really good qualifying, and we were like over the moon because we so finally felt like, yeah, we made gold fleet. And we uh, there's 40-something boats, and we were 20-something. That was the best internationally we yeah. had ever done. How long is that race because that's not no days it's like days days, right? days, of, days of racing so lots oh, okay. of short races so what they do opposed to like what i do now which is ocean racing uh they'll go out there'll be a start boat mark boats they go place this trapezoid course yeah uh with all these different marks everywhere and you have to do this set little course every time and roughly how long does that course take? uh less than an hour oh wow so it's fast yeah it's yeah. like bang 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 yeah. you're doing multiple races because it's a low point scoring system so say you have 10 races a first is worth 0.75 of points mm. second's worth two points so on and so forth so whoever has yep. the least amount of points wins yep. so. so you're you're going an hour pretty hard out and it's all yep. wind powered yeah how much physical strain is is it to uh, do that hour a lot yeah like you're rude you're like you're rooted for it. and different classes are a little bit different uh lasers in particular are very physical you're hiking so i was a. Uh, I was what do you mean hiking on the boat? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a term where you, there's a little strap. You put your feet in it, and you basically all your core, your hammy, or your quads are all locked out. You're, uh, you're basically uh, – it's hard to explain if I, we need to do a little cutaway to show a picture. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're, you're basically getting your body out on the side of the boat. You're hanging off. I, I think yeah. everyone's seen that. Yeah, you're strapped yeah. in and you're hanging off the side. Yeah, of and it's, there's oh. there's technique into it of how you how you because you can in a laser the good people can when you're in that position you can physically move the boat around by lurching it and moving it in and out and side mm. to side you can you jerking it around. Yeah. So there's a lot of technique, but a lot of strength. You basically have the strap on your tippy toes as you're hanging on. hanging off with yeah. that yeah are you close to other boats is there oh, any like, like yeah, are you just like, like right there you touch yeah them. yeah so is there oh, some always tension con- between boats yeah yeah you're always yelling was, oh really yeah yeah Talk to it. yeah 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 that's the worst thing you've yeah. seen someone that you passed oh uh, god i couldn't remember <laughs> but in big boat racing now when say what happens is you're so close and in the course the wind is shifting and uh the way it works is you know, certain sides of the course will be favored because of which direction the breeze is. Oh, so, so you want to be if you're like area. next to someone, 
and they're not they need to tack over and you're going up when you're like you're yelling at them to go because you're missing a shift and you got to get back over yeah you're yelling at people and then there's always contact and yeah different languages yeah yeah, yeah totally it's crazy <laughs> yeah so have you in, crashed into another boat badly yeah totally in uh what happened oh that's why i have insurance i can't remember and it was in france at the Europe 470 Europeans in Brest in France we had a big crash whose fault was it and who got most angry was it your boat or the other boat oh uh, I can't remember who was at fault I think we were we <laughs> t-boned someone which means like we fully hit them like, yeah right on, on. Yeah, on. Yeah. which the boat that you hit does no damage because the bow of the boat's pretty strong and also you, when you're going head first into another boat the yeah, other boat doesn't really take yeah because this no no, no <clears throat> your boat doesn't their boat does uh, yep. you literally go in straight through them <laughs> <laughs> your strongest part to their weakest part <laughs> yeah yeah i can't remember so you messed bad. up that boat yeah 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 but it have uh, it happens all the time just like sails you break them all the time and you fix yeah. them and then yeah boats you've got to fix it and get back out there does it come to a bit of a altercation back on shore well oh, no 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 never like like <laughs> yeah it can get a little bit heated but you have to like protest or you gotta go forms and you go that night to like a committee and like there's a whole hearing and stuff and then you get disqualified and then you get insurance it's a harangue it sounds like a difficult sport yeah it is it's yeah. like very nuanced there's so many different aspects and it's so wide in the variety of what you're doing and how yeah. you're doing it so yeah. Yeah, for the Olympics, it's um, it's super hard to follow the qualification process for a lot of sports. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sailing in particular. Uh, I, I do know we've had some decent ones from Norway, but what, yeah. are, the, what are the main nations that are dominating at the Olympics? Uh, so the countries that have done really well, uh, and it used to be not always, it used to be America, mm. U.S. sailing did very, very well That's when I was good. growing up. Uh but then there is a bit of a shift. Uh, the UK and Australia are very, very good, very consistent. So they're always putting elite level teams together mm. uh, and doing very well. So but there is certain countries that always have, but different classes have different specialists who have been, become very good. So it's it's everywhere. There's like 30 different countries. When you're out at that level, there'll be 30 countries represented yeah out there on the race course yeah, yeah. that's cool yeah is, is it um is it a rich person's sport uh yeah definitely like it's, yeah. no like we were we were a poor like we were just dirt bags <laughs> <laughs> so we both worked so we were both sail makers uh so we were working scrounging when i first started uh sail making i was living in a winnebago next to the loft <laughs> yeah in canada just because to save money to do that uh and yeah the teams that do well it's an equip first of all it's an equipment sport yeah so the equipment means a lot like yeah. formula one oh, yeah 100 yeah. percent. so uh everything from the the so you have the boat the hull the boat you have the foils you have the mass the spars and then the sails it all changes, it all evolves, and it's all expensive. <laughs> yeah, so you got to keep keep buying new stuff year after year. Yeah, after year. and people are always changing, so it's it's a perennial, uh, it's a perennial. Every year there's something new. Got to try it. So it's very what's in fashion with our sport, and mm. people are constantly trying. When they are constantly trying new things, it just means you're cycling through gear that a costs a lot and may not work mm. but you have to try it because your competitors are trying it and what if they get met it's yeah so it's a lot of testing there as well oh my god so much so would you say you could classify sailing or you can split it up into racing which is mostly what they do at the olympics and then yeah. ocean sailing which is what you're doing now yeah but, they, but they're gonna it? get that into the olympics now too double-handed oh, wow. ocean racing yeah okay so which how is, how would you explain the difference well let's put it this way sailing I would say, let's break it down more. There's cruising, which is like not competitive. You mean like, leisurely? Yeah. You know, people just, that just want to have a boat go yeah. sailing. People in pit water with a sailing boat, right? Yeah. But those same people also will uh, be club members and want to do like twilight sailing, which is don't, aren't super competitive and don't have a racing boat. But you know what? On a Wednesday afternoon, they want to go out and do a race and have some fun and be a bit competitive. There's a lot that is a massive market. A yep. lot, a lot of people enjoy that. And 
there's a lot of plus side to that. You've got a boat you can use on the weekends to go more, go cruising off somewhere. Then you, you can go have a little fun during mm. the weekday after work and go racing. And then you've got, say, racing, which can be split up into, say, Olympic level stuff, uh, small boat sailing, which doesn't have to be Olympic level. There's millions and millions of different little boats that everyone can sail. And yeah. you can be a member wherever, whatever club, and go sailing everywhere from the rivers to the oceans you name it uh and then you've got like ocean ocean sailing and ocean racing yeah which is which is uh, sydney to hobart yeah that kind of stuff, of stuff yeah. yeah okay so when did you start getting on those bigger ocean races well, well, that, to sydney well that's to why i moved here so uh we've got a few there, there is ocean racing back home but it's very uh it is such a small percentage of that type of sailing in north america uh the vast majority of the people racing are sailing uh like uh, events that you would take your boat to for a week or a weekend long weekend go mm. sailing uh do those short courses and then take your boat back home with you yeah that's the majority of people like small keel boats where there's three or four people so that narrow niche of like ocean sailing is really tricky to get into and my background uh where i was from there, there isn't a lot of it uh there's two big races these mackinac races in the lakes that go to this little tiny island at the top of michigan uh yeah, we do those and they're great but there's only two of them of the year yeah so to go do newport to bermuda which is a big race over there i mean if you're not from newport unless you're a yeah professional sailor you're not so just gonna rock up and go <laughs> go and do it yeah. so after after 2004 i decided i wanted to uh, i just wanted a, a change a sea change so i was looking so at your play. main reason for moving to canada to sydney was to do the sydney to yeah. hobart yeah yeah it was <laughs> just took your whole family with you and like well uh at that stage danica my now wife of 10 years or no seven eight years we had been together like a year and i said hey do you want to move to australia <laughs> and she said yes uh so because of sail making uh i had a in uh my foot in the door i got a job here in mona vale mm. uh with north sales and uh because of them i came here saying hey this is the type of sailing i want to get into my boss who's a legend michael coxon said yep we can help with that so you come work hard and they he did a really good job of saying, all right, well, here you go. Here's an opportunity yeah. to go on these big boats and go So do one this. year later after you moved here, you basically got on the Sydney to Hobart race, yeah. which is a world famous race. Right? Yeah. And to be lucky enough, I wasn't just on a boat. I, you know, my first year of sailing here, I was on a Volvo 70, uh, which is a type of boat that they do an around the world race on oh wow yeah yeah so i was very lucky roughly what's the price tag on that boat oh god i couldn't even tell you millions and millions and millions to build because they're not a they're just not sitting in like a car park yeah. oh i want to buy that one <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to build them and back then yeah it would be millions and millions yeah. i couldn't tell you how much uh what but, the actual put in water cost would be but yeah, yeah not cheap no 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 so explain um what the sydney to hobart race is yeah. and how was your first you know journey with that yeah well i think a bit of history the sydney to hobart is renowned of being this like the mount everest of offshore sailing and there's a few of these races a uh, 600 mile long races around the world there's a sydney to hobart there's the fast net uh which are regarded as the two big prestige events. And they're both can be very, very hard. Uh, but the Sydney to Hobart is renowned of being like a tough, hard race uh, because you're so low in your latitude. The weather is always a big factor and it's generally uh, an upwind race. So uh, when you're just bashing along. Uh, so what time of year is it usually? And when you say upwind, it's always, it, it's, not usually it's yep. every it starts on boxing day and boxing it has day, for yeah. 75 which years. is australian summer australian summer yeah and when you say upwind do you mean it's a so, so you're sailing against southerly the wind? Yeah, yeah you're sailing against is the it wind. usually a southerly around yeah. that time yeah it doesn't well you can start in uh, nor'easters that's the summer yeah predominantly Sydney. the summer breeze you, the the classic hobart race uh is you start in a nor'easter you get down the south coast 
and then you get smacked in the face with a south a southwester like a southerly change okay i think that is <laughs> not even for someone like me who follows the wind a lot yeah I did not know that because yeah. in summer in Sydney it's generally northeast. Yep. But then you're saying as soon as you leave Sydney and how far south are you going when you hit the southerly? Uh, I want to say it's like 250 miles, but it's not like. And where's it, that on the map, roughly? It, it, okay. Well, let's put it this way: it, it's not like a point, uh, a geograph, uh, a point, a physical point where bam, it's going to be southerly here. That's the tricky part of the race. Yeah. But weather pattern wise, you start the race and then depending tactically it was where that southerly is going to hit ah so that does that decide whether or not how far offshore you go or how close to shore yeah exactly all these different things so you're trying to find uh it's called like in that transition where you want to place yourself on the race course yeah uh and how bad and strong that change is going to be because they can be really terrible and like uncomfortable and nasty so when do you as a crew make or even who makes that decision of yeah. how far or how like you guys must just look at the wind charts all the time every single okay. hour yeah and then when does that decision get made of where we're going to line ourselves well uh the hierarchy on a boat like a high-end racing boat uh there's two people that will make that decision yeah so uh the crew split up into teams basically uh, and at the, the pointy end, you have your sailing master. So the guy that's responsible for the whole boat. So he's what I would call the captain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So he's but like the sailing master. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's the, the buck stops with him. He makes the final calls, mm-hmm. but he's definitely uh, down for input from the crew bosses uh, who are generally, uh, so they're the ones who are in charge of the, the, each of their watches, but then you've got a person so that that sailing master uh, is floating. They're not on a watch because they're always up and they're usually uh, sitting at the navigation at the nav station. So downstairs in the bottom of the mm-hmm. boat, there is a navigator at a nav station. Uh, and these are uh, usually two computer screens, all this uh, radio equipment, uh, all the internet, all the data, basically, all, everything. And that, and that, those, that navigator doesn't usually they're all, they're on deck for the start of the race with a tablet uh, talking, you know, getting out of the Harbor, but for the rest of the race, they're usually downstairs and they only come up on deck when there's a change or something needs to be urgent and to come need some eye, eyes on something. Yeah. So the, what they're, so, what they're doing. Uh, yeah, go ahead. yeah. So wait, when you, just what you said now, mm-hmm. it sounds like the navigator and the sailing master don't sleep on this whole trip. No. Th- so they're, they, they don't, they're, they don't they're, sleep they're, they're like power for nap. how long? They're like power napping. Yeah. And so, how long is the race? Uh, generally for us now, it's like under 48 hours. So the bigger boats, racing boats, <laughs> you're looking at a 48 hour. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're literally cat napping in between uh, events. So 10 so, minutes, 20 minutes? Yeah, like they could get up an hour, hour and a half. It, okay. it, it depends on how long, how a consistent the weather is and where these transitions are. Where the boats on the race course and okay, they're like, okay, we've got say 50, 60, a hundred miles on this course. They can go lie down because nothing's going to happen. So what yeah. they're, the navigator is downloading crib files, which is off the internet, down, downloading these weather files. The boat's computer uh, takes this data, the polars, takes this data on the boat's performance, uh, puts it into a computer program that takes the weather and basically out gives you a uh, output saying all right the best angle and direction for how this boat can go with this particular weather is this way what? and do they all then i've got to ask yeah do all the boats have the same computer no god no no so everyone has different software yep and well, yeah there's a slightly. very there's a few different types uh but no the the high-end boats are at an advantage Definitely yeah. because so that, they got better software, yeah. would you say? Or yeah. explaining it in layman's yeah. terms. Yeah. Wow. And generally your navigators have uh, uh, some type of meteorology background. So they're usually weather experts to yeah. interpret that data. And all they're doing, they're a conduit of taking this information and presenting it to that sailing master. 
and the watch captains. And then he makes and a decision. And then they're talking and then they talk tactically of where you want to be on the race course for these changes that are about to happen and where they want to it's like a chessboard where you want mm. to place yourself in 100 miles, where you want to be in this theoretical time hoping that it's going to pan out and it and doesn't go faster and it doesn't yeah it doesn't always pan out so. that conversation between those two in bad weather no. is that a, a bit of a hectic conversation like well, high volume stressed out yeah because in bad weather it's funny i mean in bad weather it's usually the boats are going slower so things are happening slower so you're going up when you're bashing and it's uncomfortable and it's not nice to be down there. But generally, uh, things are happening at a slower pace. Whereas, say, the race that just happened is downwind. You're running hard. It's fast. Everything's happening fast. Uh, you're going, you're moving down the coast fast. Fronts are coming at you faster because you're going at them faster. Yeah. So the speed of the, the race course, the tempo is higher. So 2019 was a fast race, right? Yeah. 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 And the, uh, the last three years have been all downwind and fast. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about 2019 maybe then. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Actually, let's start. I think what people probably want to hear about is what is the worst weather you've had out of those 12 years and how bad has it gone? Has anyone fallen over? No, I've never lost. I've never been on a boat that we've lost anyone over. But that being said, I've, I've been very lucky in the, the group of people that I have. We've kind of had the same pathway the last decade or so you tend to stick together so uh, similar crew across similar the years? crew yeah because um, we're comfortable with each other mm. so uh when you're high enough up in the uh in the ability to select who can come on these boats and as you cycle through the boats you tend to stick together with the same five six ten, ten people mm. uh and A, I'm comfortable with being on the boat with you. I know your known quantity. I know, yep, your strengths and your weaknesses. You can trust so, them, right? Yeah, exactly. That's a big part. So I've been lucky enough to move around with a really good group of people where uh, how we've been sailing and we're very conscious of safety and haven't had, we've had, I've had many massive breakages mm. but never people so you never yelled man overboard no no god <laughs> thank god no, okay. no but you've had some bad weather though across those oh yeah, yeah. we i've uh how scary I, is that? yeah it can be but like it's all relative to you know it's like asking a mountaineer how scary is everest or how exposed you know mm. i think you just become well, i think that can be freaking yeah scary. <laughs> <laughs> i think you just become used to it uh do you mean that you're not scared in the moment because you're so occupied with your tasks? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what are you doing? No, but on you're the boat? you're definitely conscious. Okay, you're definitely aware of yes, this can go wrong. Uh, in big boats, uh, everything's made out of carbon fiber, and everything is built to tolerances where they're going to break at some stage. So, okay, if, yeah, <laughs> it's not great. No, well, <laughs> if, in layman's terms, if you overbuild it, it's going to be heavy and it won't be fast. Okay, so, so you're pushing the limits, you're pushing of what's the limits manageable. of the engineering uh, and how the construction Damn. of boats, sails, yeah. and spars sounds sketchy. Yeah, have you lost a big sail on a trip? Oh yeah, all time. Yeah. Sails are in, are disposable. <laughs> what, ha what happens then? Explain. Like I've never seen that. Uh, when they blow up, I've, we had like a really famous one on the harbor. Uh, they do this race called. Uh, the big boat day so it's the two weeks before the hobart race you put all these hundred footers which are not meant to go around the harbor at all because they're too big they're too hard to sail they're really great in the ocean you can go on a straight line it takes 18 guys to get stuff to happen mm. but in the harbor it's always it's a nightmare and yeah. like it's the most high pressure because you got two weeks if you break something You've got two weeks of Hobart. It's a yeah. frantic rush, but it's a big ego to be out there and have your yeah. big sailboat racing around the harbor. And we had this brand new boat, uh, brand new hundred footer had just been refitted, had a year refit come out and we were just macking along in the harbor of uh, this big sail, this R1. And we were racing with wall oats. And Sorry, you, we were racing against Wild Oats and we were just getting ahead of them. Boat. Yeah, it's another 100 footer. This boat was Perpetual Loyal at the time. Yeah. And uh, we had this R1, this big sail up, and we had all these media boats following us, these two big boats blasting along. And this, <laughs> we had, got this gust and like couldn't ease, ease, ease. And this sail just 
exploded <laughs> just into like a, a, a hundred pieces. Does it rip in pieces? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not. It's a. It's a. That was a, a <laughs> wow. 3D molded. Uh, like a 700 square meter sail and it just just rips apart just like it, it literally just explodes the and engineering does the boat fails. just slow down straight yeah, away it just goes <laughs> it just like it goes from like heel 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 and everyone's bearing away everyone's trying when it's called easing so you're easing the sheets you're letting everything out because you're just There's trying so to power spill yeah, yeah spill all the air out of everything and we couldn't ease enough and just that, that sail just explodes. So you said you're keeling, you're on the, <laughs> the side. The boat's like heel. We had like 30 degrees of heel. The boat's like fully leaned over. We're coming wow. into the uh, like south head with nowhere to, we, we, we had to furl this thing up. We couldn't because there was so much wind. Yeah. And then we just got this gust bore away and the thing just exploded. And then the boat just goes flat. Yeah, the boat yeah. goes flat. But then all of a sudden. <laughs> and the other like, boat just goes powering on. Yeah, but you're right, now you're, you're more against. worried. You've got 700 square meters of flag just everywhere bits of material everywhere oh, so then my. it's like all hands to a not damage the asset not break any more uh, yep. you just broke <laughs> get <laughs> and get everything under control before you have one yeah so that was yeah but yeah spinnakers they blow up all the time sales blow up mass yeah. uh like i just did uh in november of this year on waldo so we were doing a race uh leading into the hobart uh from Sydney to this island called uh, Cabestry Island, which is up at Port Stephens. It's a night race. You start Friday night, you race up to this island, come back around the island, finish usually Saturday morning. It's come like back 12, to Sydney. Yeah, it's like a 12-hour race. <clears throat> yeah. And it's this blue water point score. It's like a uh, lead up into the Hobart race. And we we had a compression failure in the mast, and the mast literally exploded at the deck level. And was just hanging there, and that was like so. It a, snapped in half. No, or did it just stay? Uh, it stood upright. It it, it was it was Leaning. broken, but yeah. hanging in there. Wow. Yeah, that, and that that must be dangerous, though. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, and that's like when you say uh, dangerous situation, but you're conscious of what's happening around you and how bad it's going to go. Mm. And that was, you know, again, uh, professional level. We, uh, I, I still to this day, I don't know how we, it didn't fall over and damage the boat and break. Mm. Uh, the, the, the crew did a, an amazing job of saving it, of keeping the uh, hang, it was hanging off the, uh, the port cap shroud. And that was it. The only thing keeping the mast up. Yeah. And this is 40 knots offshore spearing off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sails up, mast is broken, furling everything up getting the mainsail down, which took hours to get down. We destroyed the main, put a big, huge tear in it, getting it down. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, get the boat with mast up into Newcastle. So you just had to abort the, the race. Oh, the race is irrelevant at that stage. Yeah. It's saving the mast uh, <laughs> because you've got uh, six weeks of the Hobart race. Yeah. So if the mast was would have fallen over, the Hobart would have been done for the boat. But because... We managed to keep the boat upright, keep the Big mast upright. upright. It was able to get repaired. Uh, for the Sydney to Hobart. Yeah. Race. So yeah. same boat, same Same mast. Mass. Mass was way. repaired. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but wow. yeah. You would have been nervous about that for the Sydney to Hobart though, as you're oh racing Because it could well, have the, broken again. Yeah, right? oh, totally. Like with yeah. the guys, when, the, when they were doing the sea trials after, and I, I was talking to the boat captain, uh, and I was like, so how were you? Like how puckered were you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because there's a lot of tension, you know, whenever you pull anything on. These boats are all carbon. They make crazy noises, like ever, like popping, banging, everything. As you're racing. As you're, yeah, just, it's uh, so loud. Yeah. So they, uh, the tension, oh, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. You're just waiting for something to pop and break and the whole thing could come crashing down again. <laughs> Describe your role on the boat. As it, so let's say for, from Sydney to Hobart. What yeah. you, what's your main role there? Uh, well, I'm a trimmer. So, uh, so... Um, by trade, I'm a sailmaker. So I've been working as a sailmaker since, uh, God, I'm like 19 years into it now. Uh, so uh, looking at sails, sail shape, that's what I do. So all, yep. on the boat, I'm, uh, I'm a trimmer, which is usually mainsail, jibs, spinnakers. So I'm part of the team that uh, is trying to make the boat go fast. So when we were talking about tactics and strategy and all that, I have no input 
at all yeah. in that aspect. My goal is to, when they come up and say, all right, this is where we're going. I'm part of the, let's figuring out which A, which sail combination you put up mm. and how to make the boat go as fast as humanly possible. Yeah. It's to that point. So that imaginary <laughs> point they're telling you to go to. <laughs> I would, I'm guessing that means keep having the right sail on, keeping the sail at the right angle or stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all set up. There's like, and this is kind of the, uh, you know, we've got these sail selection charts which tell you with angle and wind speed and which generally is the best. And the computer downstairs has all this information too. So before a race, one of the big parts of the race is uh, we'll get a, a route, a routing done. And they'll say, okay, you get this big printout, this information saying, uh, here's how long we think the race is going to take this particular boat at the fastest course you're going to do. Here are the wind angles, wind speed. Here's the sales, percentages of the sales that you'll mm. be using. So we've got this huge quiver of sales for these big boats. But for a race, you don't want to take the whole lot because sales weigh a lot. And you, you want to have the right yeah. sales for the race to, and have the as least sales as possible for the weight. Mm. So uh, you have an idea for the race, a, a pretty good idea nowadays, uh, what sales you're going to take. So how many like, did you take last year, 2019? So 2019, it was a downwind race. So uh, we skipped a lot of the jibs, which is the sail up in the front, the upwind sail. We didn't take many jibs. Uh, we left, I think we took uh, a medium, a heavy, and I want to say we didn't even take a four. No, maybe a medium, heavy, and a four, which is... <laughs> yeah, sailing <laughs> terms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you took... Uh, and when two we, or and three we, sales. And we took uh, many, we took more spinnakers because we we're afraid uh, we we're going to be pushing hard downwind. So what's a spinnaker? Uh, spinnaker is like the big uh, downwind sail. Yeah. They're like the balloon, I guess. That's probably the one sail. we associate with yeah, sailing, you know, right? When yeah. the wind's strong and they kind of like, Yeah, they're like the big, they're usually white or sometimes back in the day, there are lots of colors. Mm. Uh Because those blow up, can blow up pretty easy. So we decided... Uh, to take more of those. Uh, when you say blow up, they might get ruined, so you need to get them off, take and put up another one. Yeah. Need spares. So there's, uh, <laughs> for different wind strengths and angles, there's different uh, shapes, sizes, and materials. Mm. So we decided, I think we took two A2s, an A4, uh, and a Masthead Zero, which is a <laughs> to cover what we thought we were going to have for that race. Yeah. And it actually it worked out really well. Our navigator, Adrian Callahan, was really good. Coco, my boss, was a sailing master. Did a really good job with narrowing that down yeah and yeah we had we had a pretty well covered so yeah as a 62 footer we were the seventh boat to finish to get across the line which so, is pretty good because we beat uh boats that were bigger for us boat for boat so we beat them across the line which generally doesn't always happen which meant we mm. sailed sailed really well we sailed really well we won our division we were fifth overall uh, how many divisions seven. are there? Is that like just a bunch? Yeah, or is yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I so think that gets there's confusing. nine divisions, seven or nine. Seven, and is that like depending that. on the size of the boat? It's depending on the rating. So there's this like, uh, there's this rule called the IRC rating. Um, and it's a secret rule. Uh, you have to pay to have uh, an IRC uh, accredited measure come. And for two days, they measure all your boat all these different aspects of your boat yeah that you don't know what it is what yeah uh you know the measurements that they're taking okay but that data then goes to the uk it gets put into this hidden rule yeah so and then out they just give you well i'll put a number to you wow and faster <laughs> boats have a higher number and that's basically the reason the rule's hidden is because you don't want to have cheater boats yeah so if everyone knew the rule they would bend the rules to make a boat to benefit and have a lower rating, but be very fast. So the whole point of keeping the rule hidden, which it doesn't, the people figure it out how to bend the rules and mm. make the boats and sails and all of it better, but they keep changing. They, they they'll change the, the rules, rules every year. Yeah. To account for these little modifications that people are doing. So roughly nine divisions sitting into Hobart, but there's yeah. generally one famous winner, right? They, the so one that gets put on the news. Yeah, well, there's two different things in the in the Sydney to Hobart. The, the I would say the 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 most famous for uh, that everyone knows is the Lion Honors. And that's the first boat to get there. 
So uh, Lion okay. Honors is... Uh, Do they all start at the same time, though, from yeah. Sydney? Okay. Yeah, we all start at the same time. How many boats, roughly? Uh, oh, God, I can't remember this year. There was 100 and something. 130, I think, this year. Did you start at the bridge? No, no, we start... Uh, you start at South Ed? No, no. Uh, way we start at like shark island oh you start way in yeah 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 in the uh harbor. and this year there was three start lines Damn, 100 so they're boats there yeah <laughs> even more than that it's tight yeah 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 well, yeah especially with the 100 footers so there's three separate start lines uh the big boats are at the first line uh medium-sized boats in the middle and the small boats at the back and then there's out the heads there's three different marks so the big boats go to the furthest mark because they were the furthest up of the f- the first start line okay. and the small boats go around the closer mark. Uh, yeah. Just and to keep you, the time. Your boat considered a small boat? No, we were a big feet? boat, but uh, oddly enough, we were in the middle start line this year, which is a, a weird little hiccup that okay. so explain, with the rating. So explain the normally, sizes though. So what's, uh, a, what's considered a big boat? Uh, I would say anything over 50, like a TP 52, it would be, okay marginal it's like so your between, average size i would say for me big boats are 100 to say 60 foot that's okay. a, that's your big boat and then yeah. medium roughly say 45 to 55 60 foot yeah yeah and then small there isn't very many boats that are say 35 foot to 45 wow so yeah. and how many staff would be on a 35 footer that goes six i'd say about six okay yeah Damn, that's tight space. Yeah. I don't know how they do it. You can pay me enough to go. <laughs> <But like laughs> you don't that. want to do that again. No. Yeah. No. I've okay. been, uh, uh, sorry. I've been really, I've been really lucky because normally God's like my boss who's done 30 of them. Yeah. He's done them on these little boats back in the seventies. And like, I couldn't imagine being out there for five or six days on these little boats. Wow. Uh, but now for us, we're pretty lucky. We get uh, one weather system. Which means that the boats go so fast nowadays that we, it's a known quantity. We know that we're going to get a front at some stage Mm. and the weather, uh, the weather is usually fairly accurate. Then we know when that's going to happen. And, but back in the day, you'd have two fronts, which made it a lot harder because it took longer because the boats are going that much slower. You're just out there longer. You're going to get more weather. Yeah. basically so you're saying now it takes roughly 48 hours but yeah back the, in the, like 70s, the hundred the hundreds are doing it roughly. in a in a day and a half okay yeah, yeah. but back in the 70s it would have been <sighs> five days yeah back in the 80s and 90s yeah, yeah. it takes a long time yeah wow but and the weather's changed the weather is different now like my first few hobarts were all like heavy weather rough and when you put it in the scale of hobarts of being rough they were like like seven out of tens and yeah. they were they they've been the last of the heavy weather years because nowadays you'll get uh, you'll get southerly changes but you you know that for twelve to eighteen hours only you're gonna have some bad weather so it becomes uh, strategy wise of managing the asset of just taking your time making sure you can get through this little rough patch and then come mm-hmm. out the other side and keep going yeah so the races have been different. And is the bigger boats fastest? Are they the ones that generally get across the finish line? Oh, first, it's a it's a, it's a hundred footer, or nothing. Yeah. yeah, and we're pretty uh, lucky here that there's only uh, six of these hundred footers on the planet, and five of them are in Sydney. Oh wow! Yeah. So so really, the race for becoming the first boat across the line is a hundred footer race. Five six boats. Yeah, that's it. It's it's the same boats year after year. Then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and same crew. No, well, the crews always change. It always okay. mixes and matches. But and do they have big sponsors? No, okay. they don't have usually really any sponsors. It's just the 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 wealthy owners wow. <laughs> bankrolling and, it. And do they win anything? No. So it's well, all sorry, prestige. Yeah. Well, you win a if you do, you do win a Rolex. But for these guys, yeah, it's not the it. Rolex is nothing. <laughs> it's like a tiny percentage of the yeah yeah yeah. So it is one hundred percent prestige and people become uh, obsessed with it like winning the city to hobart it's a milestone yeah yeah Yeah, you do get on the news and in the papers and everything yeah okay let's change um pace a little bit or topic Mm. slightly what i see a bit now with sailing is uh actually the last thing i saw was greta greta Mm. like the the really young swedish girl yeah yeah. um powering on for climate change and it's funny she like left her she left that 
UN summit and sailed back across the Atlantic. That's what I wanted to say, uh, mention. Yeah, she um, she is uh, endorsing traveling without flying, I, I guess, because of the carbon emission mm. flights yeah. um, put out. So she she sailed from yeah from Europe to the States and then back again and. There's been an Australian girl as well that did the around the world trip, right? She's yeah, the youngest. Jessica. Uh, I forget. Oh, uh, yeah. I actually did a Sunita Hobart with her. Oh, God. It's, uh, well, I can't believe her name escapes me. Jessica Watson. Yeah. Yep. What? What's your thoughts around trying to break these records, like being the youngest female to <laughs> sail around the world? And how does it work? Because... Yeah, I, I understand that Jessica's on that boat for by herself for the time it takes to get around the world. But there's a lot of assistance as well, right? It's not like she's just out there. No wife, like no, 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 no. Satellite, uh, uh, no, no you're fully in communication the whole time with yeah. people. And you know, when you talk about a circumnavigation, there's like a classic sense of it. And then, uh, I believe, just testing my memory here, I think Jessica started in Sydney. Uh, you know, you could technically go around the planet, leave Sydney, sail around the bottom of the planet and come back to Sydney and you've gone around, right? Yeah. So technically, I believe you have to cross the equator once. Oh, uh, so yep, I, get I it. think she started in Australia, went up into the Pacific, crossed the equator, came back down. And I'm not sure if she went around Cape Horn and went fully around. Fuck, it's a big trip. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. No matter how you cut it, it's a lot of ocean miles. Yeah, and regardless <laughs> how much assistance she gets with satellite navigation and stuff like that, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. That's it's, it's still a lot of time out here. Yeah. I'll, I'll put it this way. I, will, I would not want to do it. And yeah. I don't know, uh, you know, we talk about these young kids being able to do that. You know, there's these. There's a race that's about to happen called the Vendée Globe, and that's when uh, you basically leave from France in these insane 60-footers for 60 80 days by yourself and race around you basically race straight down the atlantic get around uh, cape good hope which is in south africa race around the bottom of the planet and shoot back up Come the atlantic down. and that is like max stress <laughs> and how these guys do that i do not know like yeah. the, what that what that puts your body through for that amount of time just like and no sleep like that's the up. thing when they're on there by themselves i was going to ask that how yeah. would they sleep because it's not they take so long they have to sleep but yeah, yeah so the boats are on i think my understanding is the boats are on autopilot for like the majority of the time and that's like basically uh it's a function of the navigations it's a a computer steering the boat basically yeah. so because plotting the line yeah but take. it's actually physically <laughs> gears and hydraulics steering physically yep. steering the wow. boat yeah uh it's nuts you have to be so confident <laughs> in the systems because when you're pushing the boats as hard and as fast as they do you know they're you know if you consider a fully crewed boat at 100 percent going full on they're probably dialed down to 80 percent, 85 percent, which is still so fast ripping along with like a robot steering their boat. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know what I mean? And like, uh, I, uh, the, being able to like, uh, you know, I'm going to sleep for 20 minutes and not like have something break in that time, flip the boat over and you're in the middle of the, ocean. like, that's so sketchy. No, it is fully. <laughs> and you have to, that is a personality type for yeah. sure that can do that. And what, how, what's required for someone like Jessica to get started? Do you think like for do Jessica, they just have parents that yeah, are here's a here's a boat go, go ahead yeah yeah have an adventure because another thing we see a lot now on YouTube are people just taking their whole life, leaving it behind, buying a sailboat in wherever in the states generally yeah. is yeah. what I see, and then they they know nothing about surfing and they go sailing around the world even with their family, the kids yeah maybe. yeah that. Again, so to me, that's like you're, you know what you know, and they're not afraid of the things that they don't know. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah, so you don't know how hard that is. Well, yeah, and you say. don't know how dangerous that can be. You know, <laughs> what are some of the dangers? Do you <laughs> well, think? listen, if uh, you know, 
if your keel falls off, you break your <laughs> rudder, your mast falls down, your boom breaks, your engine fails. So if your engine fails, right? Yeah. If you're not a mechanic, you don't know how to operate your engine. Your engine, uh, when you run your diesel engine, basically generates charges your batteries, mm. which is how everything works. If you're doing a long o- ocean passage, your engine can't start. You're going to be shortly without any ability to manufacture water, right? Because you have a, yeah. a little desalinator to make your water. You're not going to have any electronics to tell you where you're going and how where you're going to be. Yeah. So if that happens out and, in the and middle that's of just Pacific, one, and that's just trouble. one little thing. Like I can't start the engine. <laughs> I and that, I guarantee you, these people. That's like, oh yeah, we just go. <laughs> I think the people that do it has to have some handy skills, which is oh, what right. I don't. Ha- have it all so my yeah. dream about doing this is probably far away <laughs> yeah <laughs> but if say for instance that you were planning to do it to go to the states find a sailboat buy it and yeah. then learn how to sail you just and generally you're right you'd start around the bahamas or the you know that area where you're close to shore at least for a long time and yeah it's nice get, and warm mm-hmm. how how much what type of sailboat would you be looking for do you think and how much money would you have to spend how long is a piece of string? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, here's like a, a scenario. Your first boat, you've never bought a boat before, and you don't know how to sail, I would say you'd probably want something like 30 foot. Uh, yeah, more manageable. Yep, and you want something like a just a robust, like a 1970s, 1980s fiberglass something with a deep keel. Uh, and something, hey, you'd have to do... A, a little bit of research, a to find <laughs> yep. something that's good value and well built, and then you a have to either find one that's in good condition, uh, meaning if it's stored in the water, the fiberglass can get wrecked, can be blistered, could be like the rigging, the engine, there's all these things. Mm. A it'll cost more if it's been looked after, and if you are on a budget, you can buy on a budget, but then you're gonna have to spend a year refitting it out. It, yeah. yeah. Let's say if it is one that's in decent condition, yeah, you know, we're it's a very vague scenario yeah, here, but yeah, is yeah. that a hundred grand? Is it 250 grand? Oh, no, is god, it- no, like you could buy a boat for 10 15 grand, yeah. easy. You could buy a boat for like five grand if you really wanted to, seriously. So, you could buy, you reckon you could buy a good condition boat in the states for about 10 15 grand, yeah, even less. So, it is cheap, yeah, 100 percent. And then you can live on the boat, but you need skills, that's probably the hardest part, yeah. Um I do watch a YouTube channel called Sailing La Vag- Vagabond. Yep. And they, um, I think they're on their third boat now. So they traveled, I believe, to the US for the first one, bought a boat there. Yeah. From what I gathered, didn't really know much about it. This is a couple. And then, yeah, living the, the life on the boat. And it looks amazing, but it also looks like hard work. They know He knows what he's doing with the boat, obviously. Yeah, and I would say like... But learning on the spot is... Over yeah. the years, they've like... Be like if you're overlanding in a car or a four wheel drive, you would you buy with what you can afford, and then you as you're learning and you you realize now this can be better. Yeah. And as you're traveling, I'm sure people say no. Well, that particular boat is known for this particular behavior and doesn't do this very well, but it, this brand does. And you know, you just start getting to yeah. ratcheting up with. They want a bit more comfort as they've been spending more and more years on the boat. Like well, definitely. Nice you would just want space or, and yeah. yeah. Do you call it a kitchen, by the way? No. Galley. Galley. Yeah. <laughs> I need to learn the expression. Okay, another scenario, uh, which I know some people have done here. Uh, and, uh, can Sorry. we just go back one second? Yeah. I would say too, if it's like all the people who think, if you're thinking about this, go to the Great Lakes and buy a boat that's in fresh water. Don't, ah. don't go to Florida or like whoop whoop and buy a boat that's in salt water because they're generally, they'd be in worse shape. Fresh yeah. water boats are generally, if Not. they're kept in fresh water, they'll be better. Yeah. yeah. But then you have to drive it down. Or sail it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can do the intercoastal so you can just go straight down. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the other scenario is closer to home. I know some people that have bought a sailing boat here in pit water and they either they don't live there full time but they spend a lot of time on their boat you know they'll spend a long weekend sleeping on the boat and, yeah yeah um they don't really do big ocean sails but they just sail around pit in water, pit water yeah, which looks cool. beautiful it is 100 yeah. percent. what's the entry point to something like that well it depends i mean again it's uh for me you know, in my, like, you know, we call these, like, the book of dreams when you're like, yeah. oh, if I had X amount, what could I do? You don't need very much to buy a boat. 
uh, if you find a good enough deal. But it's where you're going to keep it is going to be. It's your and people get sucked in this trap in boat ownership. Uh, the initial cost of purchasing is very little to the annual maintenance cost. So the percentage of what that boat will cost, you could spend X amount on a boat, buy it, and you'll spend say 30% of that cost, 20% of that cost annually, just maintaining it. Yeah. So you're going to have to find somewhere to put it. So and that's the hardest okay. thing. So either you either got to find a place, find a mooring mm-hmm. and that can take forever because mooring spots are highly guarded up on pit water. So people to buy that spot. Uh, I don't know if it's like a lease with the government that you, okay. that, that you have to go on a waiting list. It's like a huge thing to get a mooring spot. And that's why people have mooring minders because they'll have some, crappy old little boat that they never use but they want that mooring spot and now whether or not they can sell that i i, I don't know okay i've got more questions around yeah. this then so let's say i buy a sailing boat that's 10 grand yeah just for the this will be the ease of the math of yeah it. and then i want to keep it in pit water on a mooring yeah but i need to apply for that mooring spot and pay for it and that can take quite a while like yeah saying. yeah and th- would I then keep it just at the mooring all year round? So it'd be in salt water? Yep. Okay. So that that's where the maintenance is coming yeah, in. Yeah. Right? So then well, I would say annually you're going to, well, then now you're going to need a tender, like a little rowboat to get out to your boat. Mm. Uh, you're going to have maintenance costs to every year. You're going to have to take that, haul the boat out, get the bottom checked out, clean. Uh, it's called anti fouling. So to prevent uh, all the growth barnacles all the stuff that wants to grow on everything mm. in the water will grow on your boat you've got to keep that clean and get it serviced and maintenance roughly uh, what's the cost of that i actually don't know, <laughs> I don't okay. know. and so how about I've the boring had... <sighs> again don't yeah. know okay only because i've never had to ever do it so yeah I have no idea what they do some places i don't think they do it for sailboats but for motorboats at least you can go into these depends the, yeah it's yeah, almost yeah. like a garage right like a multi-level carport garage and they just take your boat out of the water yeah put it put in. it in its yeah. spot and then when you want to get it out you just call them 30 minutes beforehand and then they put, put it, it in. back out yeah, yeah, yeah no pretty popular yeah there's a couple of them there's one out of kuna bay yep uh there's plenty there's one in sydney harbor sydney boathouse i know so yeah do they take sailboats in there though no. probably not hey, no definitely not yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, too big. so i guess your other option which I would probably say is going to be a bit more expensive, but if you're new to it, maybe more beneficial because there's a bigger culture and people around to help you. If you need, it would be to join a club and get a berth at a club. A and berth, keep your what boat, do you mean? Like a, like a place to dock your boat. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So if you join a club, you can store your boat there. If, if there's a spot, yeah. yeah. But you'd pay for, you're going to pay. So yeah, you're going to pay to become a member of the club, but yep. then you're going to have to pay to keep your boat there. But then you've got access. You can park there. You can wheel, walk down the dock with your little cart. Everything's yeah. there. There's usually services there too. So all the trades are there. So you can clean your boat there. You can clean your boat. You can get people to come riggers to come look at the mass, sail makers. We can mm. electricians, all this Stuff usually can come. Really yeah. <laughs> When but you then don't have it the co- skills. Yeah, but then it just it's gonna cost you. Yeah, because when you fly over Sydney oh, on a clear day, right. yeah. there's so many boats in the harbor. Yeah, like but hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, thousands, yeah. thousands of boats. Yeah. Now I'd say the vast majority of them run on the cheap. Like it's you know, mm. uh, I'd say what the market and how what I'm used to is very. That's completely different. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. exactly, and. But, you know, there's the services and the people that it's, it is for everyone. You mean you can do it. You can 100% do it inexpensively. Yeah. It's just finding, it's like not being bound by time. It's like finding the right boat, finding the right place to put it, having that time. And if you want to learn and become handy, you could do everything yourself. You just need, it's good to have like a mentor or someone that knows what they're doing can show you, you know, if you want to paint the boat, you can do that yourself. You want to like redo the gel coat redo any of the teak work or like do any yeah. of this stuff people take it on people are handy it's like tip buying a car and being a mechanic yeah. you, it's doable you just <laughs> gotta get your hands dirty yeah it's, uh, but it, it's intimidating it's like any of those things it's you so don't, intimidating you don't the know life sounds amazing right yeah the dream <sighs> but then oh. but then it's is it the really the dream like how hard would that be what i see right is people 
going over to yeah to America and getting a sailboat and then they sail around I there. See how it's funny yeah. that you say that people go to America. For me, I would go to the South Pacific. I'd like get a boat here, get a boat up in Queensland, go to South Pacific and cruise around up there. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good point. I don't. I think all the examples I've mentioned that I think they've started in America and sailed it, but maybe that's because they want to sail across the world and then not start at home, which would be well. Here. Normally, what uh, the cruising route would be, say Florida, Caribbean, mm. work your way down the Caribbean, down to Mexico, down through the Panama Canal, and then you basically work your way the South Pacific, like Picard. And I can't remember. There's like a chain of islands you can basically follow to get yeah. down to either New Zealand or Australia. That sounds amazing. And then I've seen people find these incredible surf spots where there's yeah, no yeah, yeah, and totally. you rock up with your sailboat and jump out. That. <laughs> that's the dream. <laughs> it only takes time, lots yeah. and time. But yeah. see, that's what uh, I just, uh, it, it blows me away. And that's, I guess, the adventure spirit of it all. Mm. Because it's, hey, it won't cost very much when you're doing it. It's just like living out of your car. I mean, it's just finding provisions it's like van life on the ocean. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and if you can tic-tac it enough, I mean, what you want to avoid, I guess, is these big, long ocean passages where, say, you're four, five, six days at sea you sailing. Might die. Yeah, and you're just like, <laughs> you're by yourself. That's why a lot of cruisers will uh, travel together. It's just yeah. safety in numbers. If you have a problem, like if you break anything, mm. if there's another boat right there, trust me, it's like, it's a lot easier to have them help you than like save yourself yeah. yeah that must be a cool community being yeah. out in the ocean with other sailors and yeah yeah, like yeah. get oh. tips from each other or you yeah, know totally. where did you go what, what did you find i think now help with the boat? there used to be like this you'd have to imagine just like pre-internet days it would be all who you know and mm. where to go how to find it but now i'm sure like blogs yeah why well, youtube really yeah exactly yeah. yeah okay nick are you gonna do sitting to hobart next year yeah, yeah, totally. I think, well, if I, I didn't tell the story about how I missed the birth of my first son. Because you this. were racing? Yeah. No, wow. So I, I feel like I'm intrinsically linked now to this race. <laughs> yeah, you have to do it. Yeah. yeah uh, wow. So he, uh, yeah, I, right now I've got this number that I want to at least get 20 of them done. And I think Another once eight. I, and if I can get, I'll be nearly 50 by that time. And I think we'll see if I've had enough. Yeah. Do you like really? You've only got like a window where this is in, enjoyable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and but I keep seeing the the weather that like we've had. It's funny the weather for the last three years has been awesome. Like been mm. really good. Actually, it's probably say, one, two, yeah, uh, four years has been really good. And I say and I keep saying three because in 2017 we had a great downwind race but with the boat i was on we broke a rudder off yeah so i did about four hours of that race before we had to quit and well we didn't we quit by choice we had to like manage to get back to shore without a rudder uh but i think the race has changed now we're in a pattern where it's not the same hard race so i keep saying in the back of my mind it, it's always like oh god there's going to be a bad one there's going to be a bad one in the last couple of years, they just keep getting yeah. better and better. So, so when you get that bad one, you have to uh, reassess and see yeah, how exactly. much more you want to do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, Nick, thanks so much for coming on, sharing the stories about, from uh, Sydney to Hobart. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. I wonder me. if I'll ever do that race, but uh, sailing definitely sounds tempting. Yeah, and I know. think you know sailing can be really accessible. You know, If you've never been on a boat before, I would say find a club find someone mm. that can put you in the right direction because people are always looking for crew and sailors are generally they want to teach they they, they want to have people out and are like you want to share mm. this thing that you can do with other people so yeah. it's easy enough to get involved in the community and to get out there and at least see if you like it and enjoy yeah. it before taking any big leaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just put your hand up first is the first step, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Nick. Thank you, bud. Cheers. <laughs>